basically the DOD memo um, was kind of the culmination of many years process. Uh, back in 2003, the DOD released a memo about open source software that basically said, hey, you can use open source software. It's okay. You need to follow the usual rules for dealing with software, but you know, it's perfectly fine. But it turned out that there were a lot of problems when people actually tried to do what the DOD policy said you were supposed to do. Lots of misunderstandings. People had you know, just all sorts of crazy ideas that simply, they weren't true, but they still caused people to not do what would otherwise be perfectly normal, rational decisions. And so we started ending up collecting this list of, for lack of a better term, roadblocks. Uh, just complete misunderstandings of what the real situation was that were causing people to make really faulty decisions. Um, and so about a year and a half ago from now, a group of people who had been collecting these sat down in a room, brainstormed, well, gee, one of the biggest problems that we're seeing, the, the misun misunderstandings, misinformation, that's really where the mis memo came up from, was this list of, here seem to be the top list of mistakes. So I'm Dan Reisacker. I work for the Office of the DoD Chief Information Officer. I was asked in uh, April of 2008 by, by uh, Dave Winogren, who's the Deputy Chief Information Officer for the Defense Department, to draft some updated guidance on the use of open source software and, and what that might mean. So we, we worked on that, you know, got a bunch of people together and brainstormed what, what things we might usefully say as a, as a sort of policy coming out of the Chief Information Officer's office. And how can we clarify the existing rules? We found that, you know, we, we really believe there's a lot of, of open source in use in the, in the Department of Defense, and increasingly so in some ways. And that there's a, we believe there's a tremendous amount of value from this huge amount of, of open source software that exists that we weren't really getting full value out of because there was lots of misconceptions about what does the policies mean and is this open source software, is it, is it commercial, is it government, is it some other kind of category? So we really tried to address as many of those misconceptions and issues that were preventing people from using this asset that is available to us effectively. So in particular, it really focused on the, the idea that as defined by US law, and fundamentally in Title 41 of the US code, it defines what commercial computer software is, and open source software fits in that definition. So that turns out to be important, mostly because there's all sorts of existing laws about how the government uses software and when we're required to use open source, well, to use commercial computer software, not open source. But that the recognition that open source software is commercial computer software as defined by law suddenly meant that all of those rules apply. I am legislatively required to go out and consider commercial com alternatives before I go develop something in the government. Um, it's 10 U.S.C. section 2377, right? That applies to open source software. We're similarly required to go out and do market research before we acquire anything, software as well. Uh, and that, hey, if I've got to, and, and to consider all the commercial opportunities. It, it's absolutely intended to level the playing field between open source software and proprietary software, both of which are types of commercial computer software. And how do I make sure that people are really given open source a fair shake? And that they're looking at it, thinking about how can I use this in my system? The DoD has special controls for security. That's hardly surprising. One of those controls was terribly misunderstood. What it says, in essence, is because the government has to maintain software that it depends on, the government requires either warranty from somebody else who will maintain it for them, or the source code, so the government can maintain it. But people kept misreading, kept ignoring the other half. And they assumed that, well, if it's not, if I don't have a warranty, I can't ever use it under any circumstance. That's never what it said. But people never read the actual whole text. They just started and they made certain assumptions that just were true. So by breaking down these barriers and these misunderstandings, I think uh, it's going to be a, a good deal for the DOD. And it's going to be helpful, I think, for other federal agencies too. The persistent pays off, which is hardly a new lesson, but it's. You know, that took, memo took a long time, um, you know, 18 months to develop it, primarily through legal, constant legal review and, gee, let's kind of double check that. And, and um, but, you know, uh, but I think one thing, what the other agencies can learn is, hey, you know, the DOD has done very serious vetting. And in fact, the claimed issues weren't really problems at all. And the misunderstandings were just that, misunderstandings. And so I think they can point to it and say, because the memo not only just says, hey, for example, it's commercial, but it points to the US law, it points to the regulations, it says, here's what they say. And by pointing it out, other people can say, oh, 
this is the decision, here's why, and, then, and they can just reuse it and say, hey, look, somebody else already went through a lot of work to make sure these were right, and uh, we can use that as well.